Hello and welcome to this latest edition of 15, 15 Minutes on Dot Dot Dot. Today we're talking about DTM. Rene Rast is the champion with two races remaining and to talk us through just how he won the title is our resident DTM expert, Downforce Radio's communication manager, Alex Goldschmidt. Hi Alex. Hi Sam, how you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Um, so Alex, let's just crack on and talk about Rast and how he won the title. Uh, title he clinched at Nerba brings. Um, can you just talk us through how we went about it? Consistency. I mean, let's not forget that uh, René Rast secured his first title back in 2017 and was Mr. Consistency. Had a bit of a lull in 2018, which included a massive crash at the Lousis ring, but Rast was always going to be Audi's golden boy, and boy, did he show that. Um, you know, multiple pole positions. Um, he took his first win at the season opener uh, back at Hockenheim uh, when W Series had their inaugural race weekend. Um, then in Zolder, he again had another first place. Had two DNFs in the first two races, so it's quite difficult to see. Uh, then we went to Mizano uh, Again, back on the podium in second and third places on both races. A first at the Norris Ring, uh, followed by a seventh. And there was nowhere actually, apart from a few DNFs, um, where Rene had um, a possibility of maybe losing that opportunity to having a second title in just his third season in what's uh, a very stellar category that I've been following since the early or well, since the late 2000s, uh, most most specifically 2008, when uh, former Audi driver Timo Scheider ended up um, winning ahead of Paul de Resta when uh, Brands Hatch used the Indy circuit back then. Um, and like you say, consistency has been his key. Oddly, he had his worst result of the season at the season opener in Hockenheim. The race one, he was 16th. Um, only had two retirements through the season, but aside from those two freak results, he's been on the podium all but twice. Well, he's actually had three because he had one at the Lausitz ring um, back in late August. So he's had three DNFs this year. But his consistency in terms of grid positioning, um, let's just have a look at it. Nürburgring, pole position for race one, uh, front row of the grid. Um, so, And also the fact that he was getting points through qualifying because for those that aren't aware in DTM, that if you take pole position for race, you get three points, two points for second and one for third. So it's another place where you can, as a driver, add to your tally without having to worry about, okay, if you have a DNF, but you put it on pole, you've got three points. So it's not a completely truncated um, day in the office. Well, it's seven poles he got in total and he got six wins. So he's on pole more often than he was on the top step of the podium. <laughs> yeah, very true. I mean, um, just looking through the gaps, you know, he was third at the end of the, the the first race weekend, nine points behind the leader. But then when we got to Mizano, he then started stretching that lead and it went to like 10 points after Mizano. A full race victory um, gap, 25 points from Norris Ring. And, and he's kept that consistent. And the highest it's actually been this year uh, was actually uh, before the Nürburgring when he secured the title on the last race of the weekend was Brands Hatch, 37 points ahead. And his closest rival was Nico Müller. Well, he's now 56 points, I think, if my math's correct. Yes. Um, ahead of Nico Müller. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, he's got the championship. Nico can't catch him. Um, but can anyone stop him? I mean, you say he's won two championships in three seasons that he's competed in the category. That's dominance in anyone's book. Well, it's not just a dominance from Nico, uh, from from Rene Rass, but it's also a dominance from the RS5 DTM. Let's not forget that we actually have, for the very first time in a long time, WRT with Pietro Fittipaldi and Jonathan Aberdyne um, running in the first customer team for a very long time indeed. Um, so there's been eight Audis, um, four Aston Martins, thanks to the team from uh, Switzerland, our motorsport, and then, of course, we've got the BMW crew as well. So we've got a total of 18 cars, two of which are privateers. Um, and you've mentioned the cars. So let's move on to what we've got lined up as our second topic. Um, 2019, the cars were almost completely new in a technical standpoint. Um, mm-hmm. They had new engines. They were turbocharged, two litre turbocharged engines. But they only had to last for 6,000 kilometres rather than the 10,000 in previous seasons. It kind of seems like they wanted to be more efficient in one hand, 
but they were mm. trying to take something away in the other. I mean, how do you feel about it? Well, I, I've always known that DTM was going to go turbo anyhow for quite a long time because back in 2011, 2012, um, the uh, rights holders of DTM ITL, which is now currently run by former Formula One uh, racing driver and also team boss, no less, Gerhard Berger, who's raced in the DTM himself. Um, they were working quite closely with the JAF, who runs Super GT. And um, there was a lot of talk over the years. The steering committee was, um, it, it was a bit like the, um, the, the GPDA in Formula One, but it was through the manufacturers and the governing bodies to cut costs and um, make the action, the show more exciting for the fans. So for this year, we switched from a normally na- normally aspirated four litre V8, which produced 500 brake horsepower to half the displacement half the amount of cylinders, and they stuck a big old blower on the side of it, and they all produce around 620 brake horsepower. The cars are also a bit more um, advanced than what they have been in previous years. The, the DRS has uh, a single-blade flat uh, plane, uh, as opposed to like the gurney flap that Formula One has, which DTM used last year. So that adds about another 8 to 10 kilometers an hour on straights, but also provides a, a passing opportunity, and new for 2019, each driver has a maximum uh, at their disposal of 12 push to passes. So it's basically like a fuel overboost of 30 brake horsepower that gets injected into the cylinders. Um, and the funny thing is, is that a couple of laps before the end, five minutes before the end, the leader cannot use any DRS. Well, can't use DRS because they, they haven't got anyone in front of them, um, but can't use push to pass. And it's been quite interesting to see how that's worked out. Um, but from a technical standpoint, with the Class 1 regulations that are now in, in, in enforced in DTM, the cars have 30% less aerodynamics, um, standardized parts, standardized monocoques, all of them are front, uh, front-engine, front rear-wheel drive, and they are quite a handful, as you probably saw at Brands Hatch when we were both there earlier on this year. Yeah, yeah, they, they look brilliant, certainly to look at. They're some of the best touring cars that you see anywhere in the world. Um, and the DRS was something that I was going to pick up with you because people who who haven't seen the cars, it is just a single plane rear wing. It's not a DRS flap on top of a rear wing. It's the whole rear wing. Mm-hmm. Cha- the whole rear wing lifts up. And to look at them, they're, they're just striking. They are. I mean, when DTM came into this sort of monocoque era back in 2012... Um, the DRS was exactly the same. It was a single plane, uh, single plane wing, which would tilt to a 33 de- um, uh, degree angle backwards. So the, the bottom part would drop. So the back end would drop and it would have a sort of like an angular side of it. And um, the first ever time it ended up being um, disallowed to be used was in 2013 when I headed to, an, um, well, a place that's going to host Formula One next year, Circuit Park Zandvoort. They actually banned it. It was a, There was a, a regulation that came out for that weekend due to the um, the different challenges over at Zandvoort. Sand, uh, hefty crosswinds, and obviously with these cars that were a very different animal back from... Uh, you know, pre-2012, where it was all sedans with the Mercedes C-Class and the Audi A4, it, the, the game was quite literally changed, but now DRS is used at every single circuit, including Brands Hatch. I suspect we will talk slightly more about Zanfort in upcoming editions of this podcast, um, especially with Formula One heading there and the changes needed to the circuit. Um, but obviously, looking ahead, we've got the 2020 calendar that's been released. We're all eagerly awaiting to see which rounds W Series will be at as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> Mizano has been taken out of the calendar. Um, declining attendances have been to blame for that, apparently. Um, mm. But we've got two new rounds, two rounds making their complete debut at the uh, in the championship. At Mon- Monza, obviously, Italy, and mm. Anderstorp in Sweden, oddly. Well, I mean, the, uh, the, there's there's a couple of links that I can see here. I mean, uh, Monza um, is a track that Gerhard's personally raced at, but there's one guy that's actually on the ball that's still a very good friend and actually was a former alumni at Scuderia Ferrari, Ivan Capelli. So having the Temple of Speed, the Cathedral of Speed, Monza, where these cars will at top speed do nigh on 190 miles an hour in their current configuration – that will really provide a very dynamic uh, in, interest, I think, for a lot of people, especially with, um, you know, maybe the, the the possibility of bringing in other manufacturers. Of, uh, obviously, Alfa Romeo, who were back in the ITC back in the 90s when um, 
for a couple of years with the Alpha 155. You know, who's not to say that this could be a way of Gerhard actually enticing Italian manufacturers to come into DTM? And that would be great for it. But also, Anderstorp, um, a regular on the TCR Scandinavia um, calendar. Obviously, Phil Kinch knows a lot more about TCR than I do. Um, but we've got a Swede in this uh, in this field, Joel Eriksson, uh, and that would be a local track for, for him. Um, and one guy that we can't forget who is part of DTM folklore with his ruthless uh, go hard or go home motto, Matthias Ekstrom. Um, you know, that could bring me, who's not to say that anything else could happen, especially if Volvo, even though they're a Swedish brand, who's not to say that someone brings something interesting, maybe a Polestar um, DTM edition could come into it. it. There's so many different ramifications, but I think it's because DTM is becoming more internationalized. There has been a push, not just from the manufacturers, but also Gerhard Berger to do so. But is there a feeling that DTM is more becoming an international championship, as you've just said, rather than a national championship? I mean, you've just got to look at where they're starting the championship. It's no yes. longer Hockenheim, it's Zolder, it's Belgium. Well, considering that was the first ever round of the DTM when it started back in 84, it was Harold Grohls who won the first ever race, but it was the first ever race where a DTM race was actually held back in, you know, that's 35 years ago. And uh, of course, WRT with Vincent Voss and the team, you know, they're based in Belgium. it will be good for them to have a, a to bring their, uh, their, their fans from sports car and endurance racing to to come and sort of cheer them on on local home ground, which is which I think is quite nice. Uh, but what do you what are your personal feelings about them going to these new tracks? About them mo- changing changing up the order? I mean, the BTCC have done a similar thing this year, changing up the or for next year, changing up the order. Um, but will Monza will Anderstorp produce the kind of racing that we need? I think with regards to if you want. Guys just going for it and not giving any quarter. Monza is going to be one of those where these cars are going to really be pushed. And and the turbo engines have been a little bit fragile, let's be completely honest here. BMW actually broke three seals on the engines, um, having discussed it with the technical regulators for DTM beforehand. Um, so there was always going to be that fragility of changing from one set of regulations to another. And turbos will spool up at over 100,000 RPM. You've got a a lower displacement engine that's going to be put under more duress. So uh, this has been the year where the the manufacturers and the teams have had to get their their heads around the new developments uh, and try and work to it. And and there's always going to be that sort of like, what if this didn't happen? What if that did happen? Why did this happen? And so this is like the the sort of like the... um, the year of where it, it's sort of like it's like a little child that just needs to be helped to be developed and, and move on from there, really. Yeah, and for the last couple of minutes, we'll obviously talk about the event that it's got you excited, it's got me excited, every fan of touring cars globally pretty much excited. <laughs> the dream race that will be happening at Fuji in Japan, which will consist of the Super GT cars yep. and the DTM cars. I mean, th- this is a match made in heaven, isn't it? Oh, it's brilliant because it's not only that, three of the cars from Super GT will be coming over to the Hockenheim season finale. And one of the drivers already confirmed is 2009 Formula One world champion and also the defending Super GT GT500 champion, of course, Jensen Button. He's coming over in a Honda NSX with Team Kunimitsu at Hockenheim. See how he can see how he gets on against well, these drivers. There was always talk that JB wanted to do DTM. And uh, if anyone might remember from memory that he was against Gary Paffett at one particular point when Gary was the test driver for McLaren and JB was working in the team and got a passenger ride with Gary in the Euronics DT, uh, Mercedes DTM. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 a really exciting time because obviously the class one regulations have come about, uh, which means that all cars have to, have to be homologated as front engined rear wheel drive um, because at Hockenheim and at Fuji, um, Honda will still be able to use the mid engine platform that they're currently running, but have to switch to front engined for next year with the NSX GT. Um, so we've got people like uh, Tsugio Matsuda, Ronnie Quintarelli, Nick Cassidy are going to be involved. Um, and so there's going to be three wild cards. So Honda, Lexus, and Nissan will provide 
a car at Hockenheim. There's already seven confirmed DTM cars heading to Fuji Speedway uh, for the 22nd to the 24th of November. Um, and there's a slight difference because GT Super GT at the moment in the GT500 class is an endurance platform. However, for the Dream Race, it's going to be the same race weekend format as DTM. So there'll be no push to pass, no DRS. They will all run on the Hankook Ventus tyres that DTM use currently. Two qualifying sessions, one per day, and two 55-minute plus one additional lap sprint races with a mandatory pit stop. Um, and to do it at Fuji, that's, some, you know, in you know where James Hunt famously won the Formula One World Championship uh, after Nicky Lauda retired. You know, to have that amidst the shadows of Mount Fuji, it's just brilliant. And um, I have to give credit to Masuki Bando um, from JAF, who runs Super GT, and, of course, Gerhard and the work that he's put in um, in, in terms of the DTM. But, yeah, uh, I can't wait. I re- I think you and I both wish that we could go over to Fuji just to watch it happen. Definitely. And on that note, um, we're going to have to bring this to a close. Um, thank you for joining me, Alex. Uh, where can people find you on social media? Well, you can find me, um, well, if you want to find my uh, profile page on Facebook, it's uh, at uh, Alex uh, Goldschmidt, so that's G-O-L-D-S-C-H-M-I-D-T, that's a mouthful, I know, 1977, that's my uh, my Facebook uh, profile, and then uh, you can also go to a at a Goldschmidt 77 on uh, Twitter. And I've been Sam Hall, you can find me on various social media at Sam Hall Sport. Um, thanks for joining us and there will be a few of these coming up in very very quick succession actually we've got a few planned for this week so keep an eye out on the downforce radio facebook twitter and instagram pages and we'll see you next time thanks for listening 15 minutes on the dtm with host sam hall produced by florian schmeis this was a high-speed autobahn production for Downforce Radio, the nation's motorsport station. Thanks for listening and see you next time.